and welcome to Ancient Text Podcast. My name is Jonathan Coburn. This is the first episode in a series wherein we will explore the entirety of historical source texts, ancient religious or spiritual texts, and everything in between. And the first one we're reading here is a strange one. My goal here is to try to analyze these texts, assuming that everything they say are true, and to rationalize often crazy things these types of texts tend to say. This is not, in a strict sense, a historical podcast, but rather a podcast dedicated to reading ancient texts. And thank you for joining me today. Our first episode, which I picked to set the tone of this podcast series, is on Historia Regum Britanniae, a medieval book concerning the ancient history of Britain. In chapter 1, Geoffrey of Monmouth basically says, Gildas and Bede have really good books. However, they don't cover Arthur or other ancient kings. Geoffrey then claims that he obtained from Man from Oxford a book about all the ancient kings that's totally linear all the way to back to where we're going to start from. In chapter 2, Geoffrey of Monmouth praises the land of Britain, calling it the finest island. He says Britain has 28 cities and 5 different nations, the Britons, the Romans, the Picts, and the Scots, and the Saxons. The Britons controlled the entire island until they were met with what Geoffrey calls divine vengeance, or rather, they pissed off God. He then says the beginning of the history of the people of Britain begins in the next chapter. Chapter 3, however, throws an utter curveball at us and, surprise, we are in Homeric Greece. This chapter is very information dense, so I'm basically just going to have to read most of it here. After the Trojan War, the legendary Anus left with Ascanius from the destruction of Troy and came to Italy. They were received by King Latinus. Anus helped Latinus win a war and won the kingdom of Italy and the daughter of the king. After his death, Ascanius, continuing the kingdom, built Alba on the Tiber River, and had a son named Silvius, who courted the great niece of Latinus. The woman conceived, and Ascanius asked his ma- magicians to determine whether it would be a boy or girl. The magicians came to a conclusion that she would give birth to a boy who would kill his father and mother, and after traveling the world in banishment, would arrive at the highest pitch of glory. Surely enough, the boy was born, and his mother died in childbirth. He was named Brutus, and at 15 years old, the boy accidentally shot his father in a hunting accident. The boy Brutus was banished from Italy, so he fled to Greece where he made friends of Hellenus, son of Priamus, who was kept in slavery by the Greek king. Because after the destruction of Troy, Pyrrhus, son of Achilles, had brought to Greece Hellenus and others as a revenge for the death of Achilles. Brutus, realizing that these were, at least genetically, his countrymen, lived amongst them and became a famous warrior. He was lauded for being capable and generous. He became quite famous, and the remaining Trojans flocked to him, hoping that he could free them from their slavery under the Greeks. A half-Trojan, half-Greek noble named Asicarus took to Brutus' cause, which put him in a much better position as a noble owned several castles. Brutus now decided to act. Before the next chapter, would you take some time to stop and ask, what's even happening here? Why are we in Greece and Italy all of a sudden? Isn't this about Britain? What's happening here is an attempt to connect national lineage back to Troy, like Rome did in their founding myths. Other countries, like France, have done the same. The question is, is everyone just copying Rome for the sake of copying Rome? Or does everyone saying the same thing point to it having some bearing on reality? Brutus assembles the Trojans and fortifies the towns that Asakura owns. However, Brutus with his armies went and hid in the woods and sent a letter to the Greek king. This letter basically said, Hey guy, we shouldn't be your slaves. And we're hiding out in the woods like barbarians because that's how much we hate being your slaves. Also, you should let us leave this country. The Greek king was utterly shocked at this letter, and called his nobles to help him raise an army to go get the Trojans. While he was on his way to the Badlands where he thought the Trojans were, near the town of Sparatinum, Brutus ambushed the Greek king and his army. Knowing the king was coming, Brutus went into the town the night before in order that he may spring out from the town by the surprise the next day. The Greek army fled amid slaughter towards the river Acalon. This river was hard to cross, resulting in even more slaughter of the Greeks. Chapter 6 After he won, Brutus left in the town 600 men and then went back to the woods where his people were still staying. In the meantime, the Greek king, feeling bad for retreating and his brother being captured, decided to reassemble his broken forces and the next morning went with his army again to besiege the town. As he supposed that's where Brutus and his important prisoners probably were, he besieged the city with much tact. Despite the attack, the besieged stood on top of the walls and threw down darts and spears and made a valiant defense. 
When the wall was breached, they compelled the enemy to retire by throwing fire and hot water on them. However, still being besieged, they sent a request for help from Brutus. Brutus wanted to help them, but didn't have enough men to fight an even pitched battle. So he came up with a strategy. He would enter the enemy's camp at night, get past their guards, and kill them in their sleep. Revenge for the Trojan horse, eh? He knew this was impossible without the help of some Greeks, so he convinced a captured noble Greek youth and told him to go tell the Greek guards that he had helped the king's brother escape, but needed help getting some cuffs off and to come with him. In chapters 8 and 9, the plan is executed perfectly. The Greeks are slaughtered and their king is captured. Brutus made sure to keep the king a safe and happy hostage. He led his men plunder the Greek camp and he took the king into the town. After Lou had been split, Brutus headed back to the woods. Once he was back to the woods, Brutus called the oldest of the Trojan men and asked his advice as what to demand from the Greek king. Some Trojans wanted to demand a piece of Greece to live in. Others wanted to be supplied for an exodus elsewhere. A man named Amprixius pointed out that any piece of the Greece would be temporary and that an exodus was a better idea, and this was agreed upon. The Greek king, having no other options, agreed to the demands. He held a council and was able to get gold, silver, and ships for the Trojans. The king's daughter, as part of the agreement, had to marry Brutus. They sailed off with the provided ships and found the island of Leogasia, which was uninhabited due to pirate incursions. They didn't know this, so they sent forth a raiding party who found only animals and a temple of Diana. They returned to the ships and gave an account of what the place was like and asked Brutus to go visit the Temple of Diana. So he did and brought a dozen men and all the appropriate things for sacrifice. They arrived at the place and made three fires to represent Jupiter, Mercury, and Diana and offered sacrifices to each of them. Brutus, praying to Diana, said, Goddess of woods, tremendous in the chase, to mountain boars and all the savage race, wide over the ethereal walks, extends our sway, and over the infernal mansions void a day. Look upon us on earth and fold our fate, and say what region is our destined seat. Where shall we next thy lasting temples raise, and choirs of virgins celebrate thy praise? He repeated this prayer nine times, did some other ritualistic things, and then fell asleep. In the middle of the night, the revelation he was asking for came. Diana came to him in his sleep with this poem in response. Brutus, there lies beyond the Gallic bounds, an island which the western sea surrounds. By giants once possessed, now few remain, to bar thy entrance or obstruct thy reign. To reach the happy shore, thy sails employ. There fate decrees it raises second Troy, and found an empire in thy royal line, which time shall ne'er destroy, nor bounds confine. Brutus woke up, unsure if the revelation he had received was simply a dream. He consulted his companions, and they were most excited. The wind being favorable, they decided to leave immediately. They headed west, however, they somehow ended up in Africa. They ran into some pirates, they defeated them, and then they took all their loot. And I'm not even summarizing that part, that's literally all it says. They got lost, (laughs) and they ran into some pirates. It's really funny. From there, they headed towards the country of Mauritania. Eating provisions, they raided the country, and then they headed towards the Pillars of Hercules. The Pillars of Hercules, of course, being the, the outlet for the Mediterranean Sea into the ocean, in between Spain and Africa. There they encountered the mythical sea creatures known as Sirens. They made a slick getaway and headed back to the Tyrian Sea off the west coast of Italy. There they found other nations of exiled Trojans. Their leader was named Quirinius. He was a humble man, but he was known to be able to defeat anybody in battle. All these nations merged, and Quirinius lended his name to what we now know as the Cornish people. Still ignored from the Tyrian Sea, the Trojans enter Aquitaine. The king of the region, becoming nervous at this, sent ambassadors. They met Quirinius, who was hunting with a couple hundred men. This wasn't cool by cultural standards, to hunt game in somebody else's land. The ambassadors asked, Hey, who told you it was cool to hunt here? And Quirinius said he didn't need permission from anyone. This pissed off one of the men in the Celtic envoy, and he shot at Quirinius. The arrow missed, and Quirinius ran up to the man and smashed his skull in. The rest of the ambassadors fled. Upon hearing about this, the Trojans' adversary determined to make battle. Insulted ambassador was killed. Brutus, being informed of this, sent off the women and children back to the ships, while all who could bear arms would face the enemy. Armies met, and a bloody battle ensued for half a day 
with the Trojans losing slightly. Carinius, feeling a sense of urgency, rushed to reinforce the right side of the battlefield where the enemy was most concentrated. We should mention here, Carinius is kind of an Achilles superhero archetype character, as he single-handedly broke the battle line and caused a rout on the right side of the battlefield. In reaction to these events, an enemy leader named Subardus rushed Carinius, who handily defeated them, decapitating and delimbing them with an axe. Brutus, seeing this from afar, rushed to reinforce Corneus's momentum. This momentum was carried to a victory for the Trojans. The king they were facing managed to escape and went to Gaul to seek reinforcement from the Celtic princes, which he ultimately obtained. All of Gaul was against this foreign Trojan menace. Brutus being victorious in his previous battle, reaps the spoils of his enemy. They split up and devastated the country that they were in, which they would be seven thrants. They slaughtered any person they came across, resolute to destroy these Celtic nations. He came to where the city of Tours would be, and made camp, as all of Gaul was on their way to attack them with a massive army headed by all the princes of Gaul. The Celts, once in range of the camp the Trojans had built, decided to attack immediately. Brutus was ready for them and set up his defense carefully. The Trojans initially had an advantage in battle, but being out number three to one, they were forced to retreat to their camp where they were besieged. The Celts were resolute to destroy them. The siege could not be negotiated out of. Brutus and Quirinius hatched a plan. Quirinius would leave the camp by night with 3,000 men and hide in the woods, and Brutus would sally out of the camp for battle at dawn, and Quirinius would attack the enemy from behind, perfectly flanking them. In the ensuing battle, Brutus's nephew Turinus, a man stronger than any other except Quirinius, killed 600 men in battle before being slain. This is according to the book, who the city of Tours was named after. At the height of battle, Quirinius and the men he had gone with came out of the woods and began to attack the Gauls from behind. The Celts, seeing they were in a trap, attempted to flee, which didn't work. Their forces were utterly devastated. However, the Celts did not give up. They sent army after army until Brutus realized he had to go back to sea. However, this had been an overall successful campaign, and they were ready to head to Britain. At the time, Britain was called Albion, and only a few giants lived there. But wait, are giants real? For the sake of the show, we're going to say yes, because we're trying to take the sources literal and true. I'm also going to argue there are larger and smaller races, and in the fossil record, larger and smaller humanoids, which giant is relative. The concept of giants, while mythical, probably has some basis in reality. Other than the few giants to take care of, the land was rich and ripe to be settled. They, according to this text, chased the giants into caves and mountains. Then they began to rapidly settle so quickly that it seemed the land had been inhabited for a while. Brutus then named the island after himself, Britain, and his countrymen Britons. Quirinius was given his own portion of the island. It was called Quirinia, which would eventually become Cornwall. And he called his countrymen Quirinians. Geoffrey also says the name for Cornwall may have come from the Latin word cornu, meaning horn, because this southwestern tip of the island resembles the shape of a horn. Modern academic etymologists say a similar thing to the latter proposed origin of the name, except that it comes from a Celtic word also meaning horn, as opposed to the Latin one. Quirinius chose this part of the island because most of the remaining giants were living there, and Quirinius is a super badass Achilles on steroids macho guy who figured he should be the one to take them on. Among the giants, there is one that was extra infamous, named Gilmaget, who was, according to his book, 30 foot tall and was strong enough to uproot large trees of his hands. On a certain day, when Brutus was holding a religious festival in an area where they first landed, Goemaga came with 20 other giants and slaughtered the Britons. However, the Britons ultimately banded together and were able to kill these giants and capture Goemaga. Brutus kept Goemaga alive because he wanted to see Quirinius do single combat with him, and Quirinius, being the badass Achilles tough guy type, was more than happy to oblige. Quirinius entered combat with no weapons and willingly wrestled with the giant. The two went at it, and after the giant had broken some of Quirinius' ribs, Quirinius was filled with rage and strength and carried the giant to a seaside cliff where it was thrown onto jagged rocks and defeated. There is, or at least was, a landmark for this mythical event called Giant's Leap. And all this allegedly took place at Plymouth Hoe, which is in the middle of the south coast of Britain. Brutus, seeing that all was in order now, sought to build a new Troy and settled along the Rether Thames, what we now know as London. From a corruption of a word meaning new Troy, it came to be known as Trinovantum which according to Geoffrey would later be renamed after a King Lud, which is where we would get the modern name London from. By the way, the official academic story of where the name London comes from seems 
very overcomplicated. But we'll revisit this when we actually get to King Lud. That's the end of book one. And where I'm going to end episode one. Next time is book two and a continuation of the strange mythic history of Britain.